On behalf of OFIC, the Israeli Association for the Study of Group and Organizational Processes, I would like to welcome all of you. We are thrilled to have Ed Shapiro with us and host his lecture, Why Do I Have to Do This? A question that serves as a starting point for our journey. A personal and social exploration of institutions, integrity, and citizenship. We are also thrilled to have Yossi Trieste discuss and elaborate Ed's ideas and to open up a discussion together with so many perspectives on these issues. It is of importance to observe the context of this event taking place in Israel. It is the day after a new government has been sworn in, a government that embodies an unthinkable match between different parties representing conflicting views, joined together by forces powerful enough to overcome their differences. And following an uprising of extreme violence, between Jews and Arabs all over the country, including lynch events, with faceless hundreds looking on with their cell phones in hand, <coughs> no one intervening to stop the violence. These current events expose and demonstrate the ideas we'll be, we will be focusing on, as do events and dynamics worldwide, which we will hear more about and try to understand together. I will present our speakers for this event. Ed Shapiro, is a formal medical director, CEO of the Austin Riggs Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. A psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, family researcher, and organizational consultant. He was also clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Shapiro has been an organizational consultant for over 40 years and has coached executives from an array of industries. He is the author of Finding a Place to Stand, Developing Self-Reflective Institutions, Leaders, and Citizens, among other books and has published extensively on human development, organizational and family functioning, and personality disorders. Ed is, an act, is active in group relations in the US and internationally. Yossi Trieste is a training psychoanalyst, senior clinical psychologist, and organizational consultant. He is a lecturer and supervisor in Tel Aviv University, the Israel Psychoanalytic Institute, and several psychotherapy schools. His clinic, Trieste Sarig, offers a variety of multicultural psychotherapy and consultancy services to a wide range, of wide, wide range of communities. Between 2014 to 2017, Dr. Trieste was the president of the Israel Psychoanalytic Society. Yossi is active in group relations in Israel and internationally, a member and previous board member of OFEC, and he has co-founded the Center for Research of the Psychoanalytic Systemic Approach. I am Shelly Zussman, board member at OFEC, and I will be the host of this event. Ed's lecture, about one hour, will be followed by Yossi's discussion for 30 minutes, and then we will open the discussion in plenary for about 40 minutes, which I will convene. We will conclude at 10.45 Israel time, which I will translate into other time zones, which means that our flight will be about two hours and 15 minutes for this event. Um, before we take off some housekeeping, uh, this event is recorded, as I mentioned before, and will be made available following the event. You can use the chat to raise questions, ideas, comments, which we will take later on into the discussion. And before I pass over to you, Ed, I would like to thank Leila Jamal for her partnership in planning and producing this event, and also to thank OFEC Scientific Committee. Um, anything before we start with Ed's lecture? Okay, Ed, over to you. Thank you very much, Shelley, and thank you, Ufik, for this uh, invitation at such an auspicious time. I congratulate uh, my Israeli colleagues for solving, at least temporarily, an impossible dilemma, very familiar to me. Uh, we live in polarized societies that are unable to negotiate shared missions, and you have found a way across amazing differences, so congratulations. Tonight, I want to talk to you about some of these issues, representation, social systems, and active citizenship. It took all of that for you to solve this problem. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Um, there are two questions that I'd like you to keep in mind as you listen to me. The first is a difficult discipline, but that it might help you to listen across political polarization. And here's the question. How are they right? It is so easy for us to hear how they are wrong. It's a struggle to listen to those bits of what they're saying that fit our experience 
or the task that we're trying to work together, but it is worth the effort. The second question is the title of this lecture. Why do I have to do this? The question comes up for us whenever we feel pulled to act in response to social need. The usual answer is, I don't need to. Somebody else will do it. I will suggest to you that when this question comes up, there is an answer, and it's worth slowing down to consider it. Okay. A functioning democratic society needs effective and committed citizens. Without our engagement as citizens, chaos and authoritarianism take over. But for any of us as individuals, discovering and claiming a citizen voice on behalf of others is a real challenge. Let me tell you a story. Thomas, a black British social worker from a West Indian background, is sitting on a London bus at night during a fireman strike. Racial tensions are erupting, people are setting fires on the streets, sirens are going off, and a group of black teenage boys on the bus are beginning to threaten the white bus driver. Thomas is the only black adult on the bus. The white passengers on the bus are motionless. Thomas says to himself with some irritation, why do I have to do this? When I heard this story, it got into me and I spent a year thinking about it. And what I'm about to say to you is the result of that thinking. Why do I have to do this? Is a question any citizen might ask. No. When facing an impulse to act in response to society's needs. To answer that question, you have to pay attention to issues of identity. Who am I? What do I stand for? And why now do I feel moved to act? Who we are is shaped by our contexts, our families, the institutions we join, and the missions they carry out on behalf of society. When we take up the role of citizen, we represent those contexts and the values that have shaped who we are, and representation is at the core of my argument. I'm aware, for example, that I am a white, older, privileged American man. People see me that way first. When I was growing up, these categories didn't seem to matter much. But these days, in my country, they do. Given the projections that group of categories evoke, it makes me more difficult now to convey a set of ideas. But since I'm talking to you, and about representation and how best to use it, I have some hope that you might be able to hear me and think with me about the human systems that we're all engaged with. I was in a recent group relations conference consulting to a small group, and a black woman psychiatrist said to me, when you speak, my mind goes blank. It was a stunning communication. Across that set of projections, she couldn't listen to me. And this was true around the small group, around every difference. All of these representations are context specific, they reflect social change, and they impact our institutions. Nowadays, whiteness and maleness have taken center stage, and for very good reason. All of our contexts are in transition and their links to society's needs have become increasingly unclear. Our families and our institutions are central gathering places where we can collectively shape our engagement with society. But our institutions are in trouble as we shift from an industrial to an information society. We may need to help them to sharpen their missions. I'm gonna spend a few minutes reviewing our current social turmoil and its impact on us, focusing on America, and I have great hope that Yossi will make the transition to what's happening in Israel. And then I'll try to illustrate a developmental pathway to active citizenship, focusing on the ways that social systems impact who we are and who we might become. When I was growing up after World War II, those of us who are white Americans 
had an idealized version of American democracy. It was represented by Norman Rockwell images of loving families and shared values, and it helped many of us white folks feel like we belong to something larger than ourselves that was good. Sadly, that idealized view was enabled by denial of racism, misogyny, homophobia, and all the othering that has so damaged our abilities to test reality. <clears throat> For example, in the context of the pandemic and the racial protests of 2020, Many white Americans, myself included, learned for the first time that in 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, thousands of white Americans with machine guns, planes, and bombs massacred hundreds of black Americans, burning houses and looting, and leaving up to 10,000 people homeless and destroying an affluent black community. We learned that black Americans, astonishingly, have their own national anthem, evidence of our failure to live out our professed values. I had the best education that America has to offer, and I knew none of this. We have increasingly witnessed through cell phone videos how black Americans are being killed on the streets by police. And during the heightened polarization of the Trump era, we've had to ask ourselves whether we have lost our capacity to connect with each other as citizens. 74 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. <clears throat> when George Floyd was choked to death by a white policeman, hundreds of thousands of people around the world and across many differences took to the streets in protest. What mobilized them and what were they joining? As the pandemic struck, many of us remained in our homes facing the potential virus attack on our lungs, knowing that there was no treatment available and that there were not enough ventilators. We recognized our helplessness, and we had to spend time imagining the possibility that we would die by suffocation. And then, four months into the pandemic, we watched on television as an indifferent white policeman pressed his knee on the neck of George Floyd as George cried out over and over, I can't breathe. It was too close, and we almost consciously had to identify with him. That could be me. Many of us responded by getting onto the streets. <coughs> Shaken by the power of the images and horrified by our developing recognition that we could find ourselves both in George Floyd and in the policeman, we suddenly discovered shared values and ideals. Racial bias is arbitrary and hideous. No one should be executed without due process. Authority must be held to account. Once we were on the streets, all of our differences disappeared. In the face of these crises, we could recognize that we're all members of humanity. We're all attacked by the same virus. We all live on the same threatened planet, and we all face systems of authority that can too easily become arbitrary. Street protests are powerful efforts to awaken and move the larger society, but they are not enough. A more focused engagement about society's needs requires a range of institutions where clearly articulated missions can mobilize effective action. But rapid social change has derailed our institutions. Our population has grown. Climate change, immigration, globalization have all shattered the boundaries that used to hold national identities. Technology, which has transformed our world, is on an exponential curve. And the range of family structures has broadened. All of these have left democracy and its institutions under stress. The resultant institutional corruption has been visible. Long before the pandemic, religious institutions exploited children. Educational institutions underpaid and bureaucratized teachers. Healthcare institutions managed more paperwork than patients. 
Politicians supported the needs of companies, not those of citizens, and commercial institutions inevitably focused on money, not meaning. It has become increasingly difficult to connect the missions of our institutions with the needs of society. Our basic human drive to join with others, to connect beyond ourselves and beyond our differences to some larger purpose is in danger of being lost. We live in a society that is despairing of a sense of community, and this despite how clearly the pandemic and climate change have demonstrated our global interdependency. The American Constitution begins with three words, we the people. These words suggested that Americans might find ways to speak with one voice about shared ideals and values. But that hope has been splintered by social change, racial tension, and political chaos, leaving each one of us isolated, apathetic, or lost in partisan tribalism. Even the word citizen feels a bit abstract, with its definition limited to concrete legal formulas about rights and privileges. In the United States, <clears throat> we no longer effectively teach our children how our government works, who's responsible for what, and why our country's founders structured our democracy with checks and balances to sustain central values. We have opened ourselves to autocrats who tell us what to believe. Is the truth of our society to be asserted by them? Or might we as citizens discover who we are once we face the ways that we have exploited the differences that have separated us? And given how complicated our world is, how can any individual make any sense of it without finding intermediate spaces where we might collectively develop a shared understanding of the world around us. The spaces available for this purpose are those bounded human systems that we call institutions. When we join an institution, we take up a role. Role, as many of you know, is the framework where the person and the mission context meet. Each role is a function of a mission. So for example, the father role derives from the family's mission of development. The nursing role is a function of the hospital's treatment mission. Though different people can take up similar roles and experience them differently, it is through those roles and their related missions that we can begin with others to sort out our relationship to society. Families and institutions are the contexts that shape us. Given the necessary tools, which I'm going to try to offer you tonight, we can develop our capacities to shape our institutions to enhance our participation in the outside world. Let me start with our families. We are born as members of a family group, most of us. Membership is our birthright. We know about it. One way to think about families is to consider them as social institutions that respond to society's needs. From society's perspective, the family's mission is to facilitate the development of mature adults. A range of roles, parent, child, sibling, grandparent, are functions of that mission. Each one, each role, takes up an aspect of the developmental task in a unique way, and all of those roles relate to each other. When people in roles relate to each other in the service of a shared mission, we can call that role-relatedness. I want to say that sentence again because it's crucial. When people in roles relate to each other in the service of a shared mission, we can call that role-relatedness. Role-relatedness is different from relationships, which are not necessarily mission-related. I will have a lot more to say about this distinction in a bit. Developing mature adults as a family mission does not simply apply to children. 
the adult's capacities for intimacy, generativity, and integrity are all supported by engagement in family life. Our children contribute to our development as parents. Whether we consciously grasp the family's social mission or not, we are all mobilized by it and we learn in the family setting about institutional life, mission, membership, and roles. Our families shape us and we shape them. When we leave the family, we carry aspects of them with us. We emerge from the family with values and ideals that are shaped by and transmitted through family interaction. Though we may not be aware of it, and most of us are not, we become representatives. Representatives of the family, representatives of our ethnicity, and representatives of our multi-generational history. Other people recognize this, and they respond to us in ways we may not see. They shape us further as representatives of our family's missions. Over time, we increasingly perceive the world through those lenses, and inevitably, we bring our family role into our institutions. Let me tell you a story. In a study group focusing on problems at work, a young woman presents a dilemma. She's involved in several institutions, each of which engages her interest. She can't figure out a way to bring her ideas together within any one institution, although they fit together in her own mind. <coughs> within her main workplace, a large hospital, she's finding that the small program she manages, which carries many of her ideas, cannot effectively grow and develop. There are too many competing approaches to similar problems carried by other programs and no clear decision from the leadership about how to integrate them. Her other institutions, each of which has its own mission, seem disconnected from each other. In her experience, people in different roles seem unable to collaborate. She struggles with her inability to bring all of herself or her ideas into one place, and she's irritated at her colleagues for making it so difficult. The consultant invites her to present her family experience. She reports that she grew up in her grandfather's home with her older siblings, while her parents saved money for their own home. Her grandfather brought in refugees to live in the basement. The home was filled with curiously connected relatives, friends, and strangers, tensions about who was in charge, questions about the appropriate boundaries of the family, and passionate arguments about almost everything. She was the youngest child left largely alone to watch the chaos. None of it ever made any sense to her, though she spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. Why did her family have no home of their own? Who were all these damn people, and how were they connected to her? In college, she'd majored in social science and spent time wandering through foreign countries trying to understand strange customs. As she reported this developmental story, her work dilemma, of heading a tiny program in a larger institution surrounded by competing sibling programs began to seem recognizable. <coughs> With the group's help, she began to see that she couldn't actually blame other people for creating such a similar role in her work life to that in her family life. She had done it. Once she recognized these connections, <coughs> she found herself less conflicted. No longer did she feel in a work trap from which she couldn't escape. She began to see the ways in which she was using her family experience to understand something about the world. It was a perspective she had, a lens that was uniquely hers and that enabled a way of connecting. She was joining institutions that related to her childhood questions and to her family role. Using her unique lens, to develop a further integration of herself and deepen her engagement in the world. Okay, so if the first step is recognizing how we carry our family role into our institutions, the second step is recognizing that once we join an institution, we also become representatives of that institution's mission. How does this happen? As an individual, 
When I meet a new person, my experience is of meeting an other. Hello, Val. Bye. Bye. Once I join an institution as a member, I undergo a psychological shift, and I begin to see other members not as an other, but as one of us. I'm going to say that sentence again because it's a transformative recognition. Once I join an institution as a member, I undergo a psychological shift, and I begin to see other members not as an other, but as one of us. That internal shift, when linked to mission, can cut across otherwise distancing differences of age, race, gender, and sexual identity. In the context of a mission, these differences, rather than being other or toxic, can become generative and useful once integrated within the framework of a mutual commitment to a mission that is larger than the self. When an institutional mission is clear, with ideals and values that matter to us, we join it more deeply than we join leaders. It is through that process that we can begin to represent the mission to others. This insight has freed whistleblowers, for instance, to take the risk to speak up about leaders and organizations who have lost sight of the mission. We saw this kind of courage movingly in the context of Donald Trump's presidency. Work life is stressful. Bion recognized that a group's capacity to focus on the task helps to reduce irrationality. Much of the irrationality at work stems from a focus on problematic relationships. That focus and the consequent loss of attention to the task can lead to feelings of exploitation, injuries to self-esteem, and contempt for others. When under stress at work, it's hard to sort out which of our emotional reactions belong to our own vulnerabilities, to reactions to our colleagues' behavior, or from the need to better clarify the task, the mission. We are sensitive to others' reactions, based on our life's experience and on the authority dynamics of our family life. But human beings are infinitely complex, and other people are by definition difficult to understand. Nonetheless, trusting our sensitivities to relationships, we can find ourselves believing without evidence that we know why others behave as they do, and we can blame them for our feelings. I've called this response pathological certainty. It inevitably leads to increased irrationality. Shifting from a focus on personal relationships to role relatedness can help. As I've indicated, each institutional role is a function of a mission. In our working roles, then, we represent the mission, and our behavior and our experience in role in relation to others in different roles illustrate how the system is working. To sort this out, the first step is to orient ourselves to the mission. What task are we working on and how do our roles relate to that? The second requires taking the listening position, how are they right? That is, what aspect of what others are saying fits with my experience and with the mission that we're working at? Margaret Riach, who was the founder of group relations work in the United States, once said to, once said to me that in an institution, <clears throat> if you hold to the mission like the mast of a ship in a storm, you can ride out the storms of irrationality. Let me try to illustrate what I mean. A psychiatric clinic appointed a young woman to introduce a new program in child psychotherapy. To do this, she set up an office with a desk and some little chairs for the kids. At the same time, a senior doctor was appointed, and he would come in periodically to talk to her into her office. And when he did, he would sit on the desk and put his feet on the little chairs. And this bothered her. 
But she, given that he was her supervisor, she couldn't find a way to talk to him about it. So she brought it into her psychoanalysis. And her analyst, appropriately given their task, suggested that it was a transference perspective based on her childhood experience of her father, who she felt stepped on the child in her without respecting its value. This was a useful interpretation, but it didn't address the problems at work. Her dilemma was, how does she use her childhood sensitivity, learn about herself in role, and use it at work? Could the institution, for example, develop a culture in which these kinds of role-related experiences can be used to further work? Such a culture might avoid personality interpretations, accusations, mutual blame, and withdrawal. So, for example, might this working pair consider in their roles as representatives of the mission that they might be enacting something on behalf of the mission? Remember, behavior and role illustrates how the system is working. Could they find a way to listen to how each of them is right? Could the supervisor's actions and the young psychologist's sensitivity, for example, represent ambivalence in the system about developing this new clinic, providing data necessary for the institution's evolution of its mission? If both use this perspective, it might bypass interpretations of each other's personality, accusations and withdrawal, defensive reactions, and mutual blame. That discovery would represent a work-related internal collaboration between staff members, a shaping of the institution in the mind, and a potential renegotiation of the mission. Okay, that's the second step. Here's the third. Once we learn to use our experience in role to better understand the mission, we can begin to consider learning across institutions, across institutions. That learning requires a focus on open systems. The individual and the institution are both open systems. Each has an internal world, an external world, and a boundary function that manages the interchange across the boundary that constitutes meaningful learning. For the individual, the boundary function is that part of our mind, the ego, that helps us sort out who we are and that mediates between the self that we think we are and the self that others perceive. For the institution, which also has an internal and external world, the mission is the boundary function, mediating between the internal identity and capacities of the institution and the needs of the outside world. The mission gets refined and reshaped as the institution matures. And when the mission is lost and irrationality takes over, individuals can get mobilized in their roles to do something about it. My next story focuses on the experience and behavior of people who are attempting to collaborate across different institutions. The story illustrates how individuals, out of their awareness, can end up speaking as representatives of their institutional missions. The boy who opens this story is speaking for his family, though he doesn't know it. Here's the story. An eight-year-old boy was admitted to a child inpatient unit because of what was called unmanageable aggression. He was the youngest of six kids from different fathers to an unmarried mother. The boy's father was currently in jail, and the boy was causing trouble at home. One day, the mother was out shopping at a supermarket with all of her kids. When the older kids began to cause trouble, the eight-year-old went over to one of the shelves and pulled out a can of Raid. Uh, Raid is a powerful insect killer. And he began spraying all of his siblings. Chaos ensued, things falling off the shelves, people screaming. Terrified, the mother called the cops who brought the boy to the hospital. The psychiatric resident who admitted the boy was unclear as to why the kid was in the hospital. She was irritated at the task of writing up a patient who didn't seem to need her attention, 
when she had so much else to manage. When she interviewed the boy, she found him to be lively, engaging, and not terribly disturbed. And she thought, how do I get this kid out of the hospital and mobilize social services to take care of him and the family? She brought this case to a seminar, which I consulted to, focusing on systems issues, and she talked about how overwhelmed she was. As the discussion unfolded, it became clear that all the trainees in the group, this was a state hospital, felt overwhelmed by the clinical pressure. This was a shared aspect of the clinical institutional culture. They could all recognize that these feelings were both expectable in this intense and busy clinical system and essential information. They could see how these pressures were contributing to the resident's wish to get this kid to another caretaker. But the resident felt that a good doctor should want to take care of her patient and she shouldn't want to get rid of him. So she felt guilty about her irritation and couldn't fully acknowledge it. When we turned our attention to the boy's family, the resident could begin to see that her irritated feelings mirrored that of the harried mother who had too many children to manage by herself. This recognition generated a discussion about unacknowledged anger. When anger is unbearable and uncontained, what happens to it? Where does it go? Does it get spread around the family? And if so, how? Was it possible, for example, that this child, the youngest member of the family, had empathized with the mother's distress? With great amusement, the group suddenly recognized that the kid's attempt to spray his siblings with raid could be understood as an effort on his mother's behalf and on his own to get rid of these pests. This idea made everybody laugh and relax. The resident began to think about her case in a new way. She had found a way to listen to how the child's behavior made sense, how it was right. <clears throat> it allowed her to go back to the mother who ultimately came in to talk with her and help her to gradually shift from horror at a child's behavior to recognizing that the behavior was an understandable communication about family stress. The relaxed and supportive interpretation from the resident about the kid's wish to get rid of the pests evoked surprised laughter from the mother who began experiencing the doctor as an empathic ally. This helped her to tolerate her own anger and to recognize that she was taking on more than she could manage. It allowed her to not be so frightened by her son and it helped her to maximize her family's capacities and their resources. When a representative from a family who carries bits of the system's irrationality bursts out into another system, some of us call these representatives patients. But they are citizens of the family. They're whistleblowers, representing an institution that has lost sight of its developmental mission and is in trouble. Active citizenship is an interactive process. Spraying raid is a form of interaction, but in a language that is hard to translate. If an outside system can listen and translate such behavior into language, social development is possible. But that outcome requires taking feelings and behavior seriously and discovering their communicative value. When people are too marginalized to speak, their essential communications often burst out through unmanaged behavior. An overly reactive society can lose important data that might help the community to develop. Society needs institutions that can translate such behavioral communication. We're beginning to recognize this need as evidenced by the protesters cry after George Floyd's murder to defund the police. What the protesters are asking is to shift funds from the police task of containing behavior to the social service task of understanding it to help society to develop its own capacities. 
If we were to simply focus on the child in my story, we might consider his behavior as a symptom of his immature psychology. Broadening our view, however, allows us to recognize the system he's embedded in and the role he is taking up. This child was voicing through communicative behavior his experience in role in a failing family system to an external context that might be able to listen. The story is about two institutions in interaction and the affectively charged communication between them. The two institutions, the two systems, have different missions for the hospital treatment, for the family development. People in their various roles are guided and shaped by those missions. Both systems are having trouble, but the interaction between them constitutes an opportunity for learning. I've gone through three stages now, family role, institutional role, and representing institutions. My final story incorporates all of this and leads to my central thesis, taking up the role of active citizen. Adulthood inevitably involves membership in many groups and institutions, some consciously and some out of our awareness. These multiple memberships, memberships are aspects of our identities as individuals, they are who we are. They represent the learning we have done to internalize the values of the institutions we have joined and to develop the perspectives and society that are represented by their missions. When we're faced with polarization, disconnection, and social trouble, we can use the learning that comes out of our institutional memberships to discover our roles as citizens. Since institutions are fragments of society, they are also elements of our functioning as citizens. Their tasks and their values are in our minds if we search for them. Facing social conflict, we might allow ourselves to wonder which groups in our minds might link the issues we are feeling. And we might consider, as citizens, negotiating a shared membership with others to develop, to discover a way out of disconnection, polarization, and impasse, and into engagement. Once an individual feels drawn to act in the face of social need, the question inevitably arises, why me? Why do I have to do this? This is a question every citizen must face. Social engagement includes risk. Why me? signals a recognition that something about my identity is at stake here. What forces would make individuals risk themselves on behalf of others? What would allow any of us to identify with a whole group so that we know that if the group is at, is at risk, we are as well? What forces might move us to lead from below as an active citizen? active citizenship is leading from below? All of these questions deserve answers. I began this lecture with the story of Thomas, the black British social worker on the bus, who was mobilized to act during the fireman strike after watching a group of black adolescent boys challenge the white driver. Thomas thought to himself, why do I have to do this? He was feeling irritated at the white passengers for sitting still and at the black adolescents for hassling the driver. He thought, why do I, a black man, have to stand up for a country that treats its black citizens badly? Unable in the moment to answer these questions, he made a decision, stood up, and asked the kids to calm down, which they did. How do we unpack what happened? Who is this man, and what does he represent? Representation is at the core of my argument. Thomas is not just Thomas, the person. He represents a range of commitments and internalizations. As Walt Whitman noted in Leaves of Grass, whoever degrades another degrades me, I contain multitudes. Thomas was a member of multiple groups and institutions. His West Indian identity group, his family, his Anglican church, 
his social work organization, and his British citizenship. These multiple memberships were aspects of his identity and elements of his functioning as a citizen. Each institution has a mission, and each mission matters to Thomas. Though he may not have been conscious of it in the, in the moment, he is a representative of all of those missions. As a black man, though he was irritated at the boy's anger for casting an unfavorable image of black people, he was not afraid of it. He understood their anger, and he may even have moved toward an empathic identification with them against the white authority of the bus driver. He could convey all of this to the young people without endorsing their behavior. In his role as a social worker, he had joined the mission of improving social problems. Through that lens, he could understand the reluctance of white passengers to potentially increase racial tensions. As a member of the Anglican Church, he was identified with the transcendent interdependency that belief in God entails, and he could understand the vulnerability of the larger society during the firemen's strike. And finally, as a father, he could understand the adolescent's developmental need for a limiting context, a paternal presence, at the moment of their rebellion against authority. Sorting this out might have clarified for Thomas that only he on the bus could face the adolescent's aggression and help them recognize the social consequences of acting it out. Why do I have to do this? has an answer. Feeling part of a social whole, Thomas was able to offer the adolescents the possibility of identifying with his integration of roles so that they could place their reactions in perspective. Here is my argument. These notions, joining, membership, mission, and role, represent some of the steps an individual takes towards social understanding within the self. Integration of these memberships and roles into a coherent identity allows identification with the larger social context and the beginnings of a perspective as a citizen. Thomas's question, why do I have to do this, can be understood as a question about his identity and about his integrity. Eric Erickson defined integrity as our obligation to the most mature meaning available to us. And he added this, quote, even if this risky commitment should bring discomfort to ourselves, deprivation to our mates and offspring, and the loss of friends, all of which must be imagined and endured in order not to be exposed to a final sense of disgust and despair, unquote. In Erickson's view, integrity requires the discovery of social tasks to which the individual can become committed, active citizenship. Thomas found himself, <coughs> Thomas found himself in a role. It evoked an internal conflict. His integrity, however, required him to integrate the various institutional missions that were aspects of his identity and recognize what he represented to others. Through that process, he could identify with all the riders on the bus and discover the immediate social need as a mission that extended beyond his own needs. Thomas's risky decision to take up the role of citizen marks his recognition, if society is at stake, I am at stake. So now, as we come to the end of my argument, let me briefly review where we have been. Much of our family institution and political, institutional and political life is so full of the affective intensity of relationships that it runs the risk of obscuring the power of joining a mission beyond the self. Our families as social institutions are the places where we begin to learn about membership, mission, and roles. We emerge from our families as representatives, and we bring those perspectives into the institutions that we join. 
We link with other members through each institution's mission to develop a shared view of society's needs. As mature adults, we then have the opportunity to integrate those diverse links to society as we reach for our own integrity to discover the role of active citizen. To increase this possibility and address our increasingly threatened social cohesion, institutions may need to clarify their connections to society's needs. Steve Jobs' original mission for Apple was this, to create tools for the mind that advance humankind. The Austin Rick Center, a psychiatric system of care where I developed many of these ideas, had, a, had this mission, to help people who are labeled treatment-resistant patients to become people taking charge of their lives. Steve Jobs' mission was about human development. Riggs mission is about resisting other people's labels to take up authority for yourself. The vitality of both missions is that they have clear links to the needs of society. Those institutions that discover the connection between what they do and society's needs can more readily articulate the values and beliefs that we all need to sustain, reassure, and transcend ourselves. When a mission is clearly linked to a social need, and when the values embedded in that mission represent issues that we believe in, we can bring all of ourselves into work. For example, if I make landing gears for airplanes, and my company's mission is simply to make the best landing gears, I come to work as a technician. If the mission is to defend my nation, and that mission matters to me, I can come to work as a whole person. I can bring all of myself. Taking up an institutional role as a function of a mission that matters adds to our self-definition, offering a perspective for examining and then competently assuming the range of roles within society. Recognizing that as individuals, we cannot grasp the complexity of our global society. I am arguing for a deeper involvement in institutions, which we can use as intermediate spaces to negotiate the vast distance between ourselves and the rest of the world. The problems of othering and political polarization are not easily solved. But when we can shift from using relationships to export blame and responsibility, to using our experience in role to address shared problems, we can begin to shape our institutional missions to link more clearly to the needs of society. That will embed us in human systems that can begin to transform the other into one of us. And when, like Thomas, we begin to see ourselves in our roles as representatives of our institutional missions, we can discover a heightened clarity about the world around us, and all of that can increase the possibility that we might risk taking up the role of active citizen. So in closing, let me remind you of the two questions I'd like you to keep in mind. How are they right? Is an approach to listening that increases the odds that you won't get lost in polarized thinking. And why do I have to do this is a question that has an answer. And that answer is not someone else will do it. When that question comes up for you, I recommend that you give yourself some reflective time to find the answer. You will learn from it. These two questions, in the context of becoming part of an institution, might actually help you to find your way. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, we have some clapping going on. Silent clapping, but clapping nonetheless. Um, Yossi, we will move over to you, to your discussion of Ed's ideas. Okay, and then we'll open up for discussion. Okay, thank you, Shelley, and thank you, Ed, for this really thought-provoking lecture. 
uh, I will try to offer a discussion which explores some of your ideas from a psychoanalytic systemic perspective, from some personal experiences, some thoughts. I called it following your title, why do I have to do this? I told my discussion, why not? Uh, Ed is important and uh, relevant article with civic ethics and is organized around uh, a critical uh, question, three critical questions. Why do I have to do this? Perhaps it should be read, why do I have to do this? How is the other who arouses my resistance right? And what is needed to heal the ill of the society in which we live or in the spirit of Shapiro's words, how do we develop active citizenship? Since uh, you summarized your presentation in such a clear way, I will go straight to the point. My discussion will focus on these three questions. I'll say in advance, my starting point is a deep identification with the involvement and distress expressed in Ed Shapiro's article, and then ideologically approximate uh, to his proposal. So I will attempt to create a dialectic counterpoint to some of the ideas presented. My personal launching point for the topic is a daily attempt to address the question, what is my role, if any, as an analyst and group professional at these times? But what exactly are these times which evoked Ed Shapiro to write his paper? Yesterday, I wrote these times, times of struggle with a global pandemic, social crisis, collapse of governmental systems and violent trampling over the rule of law, principles of social ethics and justice, and perhaps what is even more disturbing of a reality testing itself, times of what seems to be a severe global leadership crisis accompanied with, a deep, with deep corruption. But this morning in Israel, I added and a sociopolitical counter reaction, which fights it in the States and now also in Israel, and allows, let's say, sanity and tolerance to diversity to overcome, hardly, let's admit, or at least counterbalance the totalitarian, hateful, and discriminating discourse. So these times are also the times uh, of severe threats to the great democracies, including those considered eternal, such as the United States, mainly following the rise of leaders whom it is difficult not to describe, at least from a psychological perspective, as extremely narcissistic, even psychopathic, almost pathetically omnipotent and grandiose. And this could have been an explanation if it weren't for the fact that Trump, for in instance, had 72 million supporters and Netanyahu had 1 million, can 73 million people be wrong? Of course, these times are not merely times of the disease, they are also times of the innovative vaccination. They are characterized by amazing developmental leaps in which assumptions about reality are re-examined while the distance between science and science fiction is reduced to a point of cloning a person out of stem cells, organ printing, challenging the limits of life and death, and redefining the principles of physics in a way that brings it closer, apparently, to metaphysics. 
theory, for example, the quantum theory, the string theory, etc. And more than that, this time, a kind of technological breakthrough that brought about a true Copernican revolution of actualization in the field of communication, while potentially allowing multi-directional communication between each and every citizen, as long as they are equipped with a cell phone or any other end equipment. This implies that theoretically, and sometimes even practically, citizens can speak with the rest of humanity from their cell phone. Such an event, by the way, is termed a viral event, even before the COVID-19 demanded precedence over the term. So my main claim is that network technology and wireless communication reshaped, reshaped the self-perception of the Western subject. Whether it is an evolutionary leap or a dangerous mutation or both, it liberated the subject, so to speak, from the binds of the body, zoomed it into the cyberspace, and planted it in a continuous present, free supposedly from the limits of space and time, or perhaps lost in space and time. It really finds a human being as a multi-subject, a group subject, which I call on another occasion the I group. By that I meant a subject that the social network in which it is active also defines and constitutes it and vice versa. One can say that the net serves in that case as an extension of the inner world. One of the reasons why the I group gets easily addicted to the opium it provides, the likes. His eed, it can be said, no longer resides in his private unconscious alone, but rather rampantly in the back alleys of the talkbackers, while his super ego is stored in the cloud of social networks, provoking externalization of shame and converting it into shaming. The consequences of this process of diffusing the subject are far reaching, enough for me to justify the urgent search campaign Ed Shapiro declared for the return of the hero, the one courageous, clearly defined individual, well discriminated from its social surrounding, as well as the group as a whole, who is called to save humanity from itself. So a word about the leadership crisis and the collapse of democracies. Two dramatic changes have taken place then in the virtual life of the dissented subject, the collapse of the concept of boundaries. Take note, not just the collapse of boundaries, but the collapse of the concept of boundaries. And the second, the collapse of representation. Both are issues which Ed referred to quite uh, extensively. The most daunting outcome of both is opening the possibility of the direct connection between the leader and the crowd, the mess via Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and so on. And here, we of all people, the group relations professionals, are well, well aware of the psychological characteristics of the mess compared to the small work group. After all, when crowds organize into a group format that does not define roles, hierarchies, and the boundaries of task, time, and location, they are immediately controlled by the same unconscious forces Le Bon described as quoted by Freud. Individuality dissolves, the primitive urges arise and become uncontrollable, for better and for worse. The crowd, in Le Bon's view, sees kindness as weakness. It does not tolerate delayed gratification and perceives nothing as unattainable. And whether its goals are noble or corrupt, the needs of the individual, 
even the most basic need to protect its own life might be crushed by the faults of the crowd. Do you want a demonstration of crashing faults of the mass? Here in Israel, we have the Miron disaster and the Tribune collapse, where dozens of people found their deaths. The entire public, in this case, an ultra orthodox identified public, despised state laws and safety regulation and did not obey the restriction of the legal and professional authorities who warned of the disaster ahead of time. And there was nobody, not one courageous individual or formal role taker, to stand up and stop the flow of the crowd least of all Netanyahu's regime. The phenomenon is, of course, not limited to Israel or only. The direct connection made possible between leader and crowd creates a highly unsacred pact between the grandiose, omnipotent child who lives inside of each of us and the leader who doesn't care to understand his role to contain of a sublimation and transform those infantile patients' needs or fears into creative energy. Instead, those leaders back themselves with an ideology that justifies incitement, hatred, and mostly arrogant defiance against the law of the father. Since on the fantasy level, some of the elected leaders of the current generation do not represent the primal father, as Freud assumed, but rather the grandiose child, precisely this one that Lacan describes as the Oedipal child who offers himself to mother as having, in Lacan's word, an imaginary phallus, and creating in this way a pact with her against the father who is the owner of the real phallus. And therefore, he is in fact impersonating the father who does not recognize the father's law. The American version sounds more catchy to make Mother America great again. Is it any wonder these leaders, Kim Jong-un, Trump, Putin, Lukashenko, Netanyahu, and more, prefer the cheers of the crowd while trembling over the representational structure that is the lifeblood of democracy, which is founded on representation, not the methods, and are happy to crush the teamwork of the elected public representatives whose commitment to their formal roles and missions qualifies them to jointly organize as a work, work group in Beyond's terms, develop reality testing and rational informed decision-making procedures based on facts and not just on fake. I want to say a word about the relationship, the, the, the connection between relationships and identity dialectic. On the social level, the diffusion of boundaries backed up by the internet technology apparently encourage processes like the globalization, in which the inhabitants of the global village gradually give up the char characteristics of their associative identity, namely, the signs of their belongings, religion, race, gender, and nationality of origin, uniting everyone, so to speak, under the happy consumerist phallus of Coca-Cola, sucking on the collective breast of McDonald's, biting into the apple tree of knowledge and joyfully mining information on Google. Why then has globalization given birth to a resurgence of global terror when from the depths of the dark caves of the human unconscious emerge human savages returning like the archaic repressed of the ancient tribe 
like ISIS, for example, whose macabreness beheadings can hardly be contained? Well, it may be that there still is a method in this madness, even if its face is horrif horrif horrific horrifically distorted. It reveals itself when we understand that the everything goes abundant society that globalization offers also tempts the subject into liberating himself from the bonds of his society of origin associative representations exactly as ed described in this way it sheds his identity while terrorism works exactly in the opposite direction it imposes symbols of associative identity on the subject, the individual, with blood and flames and plums of smoke. When a nightclub in Paris is attacked, the Bataclan, all of its attendees are coerced into recognizing whether they want it or not, whether they identify with it or not, that they are representatives of Western culture the one that for the aggressor represents cultural and sexual degeneration. So in this view, the process of dissolving the boundaries ensured that everything connects with everything, but in the same breath, dissolves the definition of identity and therefore invites the establishment of artificial new boundaries that define new identities even when the drug sometimes provides a much more deadly solution than the disease it is intended to cure. So what happens in Israel? Well, of course, this is a very subjective view of what happens in Israel, but I will describe it in a few sentences. In Israel, this conflict took the form of a hate-filled split between the Netanyahu camp and its opponents. On Netanyahu's side, the fan, the base, seemed to encounter the man's power and probably also the miraculous ability to impose his personal needs on the public. This camp mobilizes all kinds of power symbols, some may say fascistic symbols, to strengthen the dimension of national identity while forcing it on the other, the Palestinian people in this case, and refugees, for example. You will, this is the square of the ancient father, actually the child impersonating him. On the other hand, the Balfour square represents its opponent. This is ostensibly the great mother square, the liberal square. It has no apparent clear leadership, but demonstrates a capacity to contain everybody, regardless of their religion, race, and gender, like distinct leftist, unemployed young people, disabled business owners, Hasidim who were prevented from traveling to Uman due to quarantine, and so on and so on. All of these squares seem to represent the polarization of the relationship versus identity, yet one factor reunites the two squares, the burning hatred for each other. In this sense, they share the same mentality and the same leader, Netanyahu, those in their admiration for him and those in their hatred. And yet there is a critical difference between them that is strictly forbidden to obscure. Netanyahu's square is violent and its extremists have already proven their willingness to assassinate Rabin, for example, not only in unparalleled violent talkbacks. The square of his opponents is not violent in a way that endangers human lives, at least until now. So why do I have to do this? Here I'm coming to the three questions Ed raised. So after all, I've said to this point, I will try to answer these questions in the four versions. Why do I have to do that? 
Why do I have to do it? And why not? Why to do this? Because the subject is forever a self environment creature. I said before, even if we really want to, a subject can never isolate himself from the social cultural reality in which establishes, he establishes himself. There's nothing like pandemic days to illustrate how much we cannot escape the toxic influence of the infected environment, not in the fort where Edgar Allan Poe's Red Death heroes tried to get through the days of the Black Death Plague with drunken revelry, not in our home fortress, which are already invaded by the fifth colony of our beloved children, which were secretly drafted by the virus to execute Oedipus' fatal mission of eliminating their parents, and not even in my own body, when the semi-penetrable membrane of the skin collapses relatively easily facing the droplet infection at the Bakati Patit for the Hebrew speaking. One of the touching examples I witnessed in the COVID-19 period was a report of a young therapist who described her separation from an eight-year-old boy at the boarding school where she worked. They had a regular ceremony of drinking chocolate milk together and already for two weeks, this boy who experienced most things we would not like, we, most things we would like to protect children from, including repeated traumatic separation from his mother, was concerned with the fact that the chocolate milk's expir expiration date was approaching and he wouldn't get the chance to drink it. He mixed an exaggerated amount of powder into the cup, sneezed, and the powder scattered in the room while its sweetness penetrates the roof of the therapist's mouth, and both of them burst into laughter. Until the therapist realizes that she may have been breast more than just powder into her lungs. Well, the powder is nothing but a contrasting material that colors what we have always known. Our inner world is saturated with materials that are thrown into it and out of it into others. Projection and projective identification is more infectious than COVID-19. Freud did not reject Carl Jung's words of reassurance in vain aboard the ship that carried them to their first visit in the United States, when he tried to convince him that the Americans were happy and anticipating his visit. If only they knew, said Freud, I was bringing them the plague. And he didn't mean the COVID-19. So why it has to be done is clear. Because the individual is discontentedly trapped in a society he himself creates, as we've learned from Freud and beyond. And if the face of things is, as I described, the collapse of social and cultural institutional boundaries of civilization threatens the collapse, threatens to collapse the structure that establishes our inner world as well. And therefore, it is only reasonable that the work of restoration will allow recovery in the opposite way when we as individuals succeed in restoring our internal structures. We could perhaps be contributing to the restoration of social structures and institutions which we are part of. This might make it possible to put a dam on the murky wave. But why me? Well, a personal note. I'm a son of parents who, apart from the fact they were Holocaust survivors, even if they were not refugees from camps, as far as I was concerned, they were almost Holocaust deniers. They hardly spoke in our home about their families, almost all of whom 
perished in the camp. We were a frighteningly small family. My father, mother, and myself. When I was growing up, I often asked myself, how they knew to escape Germany in time? A spoiler, I think they didn't know. But over the years, my question changed. After members of the Jewish underground burned a Palestinian boy alive, I began to ask myself a new question. And if I were German, at which point would I have known that we've crossed the red line? Would I have fought them? Israel is usually hysterically alarmed when army activities, statements by uh, army activities or statements by government ministers are compared even slightly to statements by Nazis. In a way, rightly so. Israel, thank God, is far from being there. But I believe that each Jew in Israel, Israeli, must look every morning in the mirror and ask himself, have I turned like that Gregor Samsa into a cockroach? Because the trauma is viral, it contaminates you as a victim as well as a victimizer. And you never know when you've crossed the red line. You always realize it only when you discover it far behind you. So why me? Maybe that's why. But there's also a why not me? Because it's scary, because it's dangerous. Not all the people you fight are, you know, boys who obey your protest. Because you can get injured by bullies from the other side, extremists. And after all, you also have to assume the existence of the option to escape. I will never forget the rage of a participant in the Tavistock conference. a daughter of a German who hid a Jewish child in their home and her parents who dared to threaten her life like that. They should have run away, she said. Can we dare to consider the humiliating object to run away, especially if we are willing to recognize the unpopular, but perhaps realistic possibility that we are actually quite helpless to create change. After all, sometimes we may have to be willing to lose the battle in order to win the war. Even though I can't see myself choosing this option, I have to admit that after a long inner struggle, I ended a 30 years old dilemma by deciding to perform my right to a German passport for my children and myself. I was relentlessly, relent Classly debating beforehand and was forced to tell myself, well, that's the irony of history, Yossi. Israel saved your parents from Germany. Now it's Germany's turn to serve your children from Israel. But for better or for worse, what I wanted to enable my children, I cannot allow myself. After having to fight in the cruelest wars for this country, I can't really allow myself to leave it to the religious right-wing extremists. So I took active part in the protest movement and went out every weekend with drums and flags, sometimes at Balfour Square, not before switching my sneakers to boots, even though feeling ridiculous. It is easier to kick an aggressor if you have boots. And I have a bundle of keys in my pocket, which when it's needed or to self-defense, can be used as a knuckle duster. And there's only one last point left, to understand how the other is right. Well, perhaps not always, Ed. Not when the other wants to annihilate you. Not when the other represents a value system that endangers all that you believe in and ignores you. After all, we are not social therapists. The sentence you have to understand why the other is right, even though I perfectly understand that it does not necessarily mean to accept the other's view, feels to me always to be suspected as false statement, a fruit of the anxiety 
that characterizes the liberal left in Israel as a collective stereotype, facing its own aggression, owning the bad object inside. I suspect that the ethical effort to understand where my opponent is right works only if you both are sheltered under the shadow of an agreed third, whatever it may be, God, basic human rights, nationality, whatever. When this is not the case, and the other is seriously threatening to demolish you, I am afraid the attempt to understand what is right about the other may be perceived either as a hidden arrogance or as weakness, which is bound to lead to more aggression. See the Chamberlain entry. The ability to accept the other is not infinite. Unlimited tolerance may cause the collapse of the psychic immune system. Facing whoever is looking to subdue you by force, there is probably no choice in the immediate run but to use force to protect yourself, preferably greater than his own. That is the nature of the unsettling human dialectic between Eros and Thanatos, between the desire to live with the other and the desire to nullify him, since, as you know, the subject's hell is the existence of another subject. Therefore, perhaps it's good to also remember that if you have to shoot, shoot, don't understand. And even if I well understand what Ed means sometimes, it seems not less important that the other who threatens to eradicate me also understand what I mean. Thanks, Ed, for this beautiful paper and a challenging invitation to think under fire. Thank you. Thank you, Yossi. Um, and I want to thank you both um, for, like, like you said, Yossi, for the thought-provoking, disturbing, and beautiful talks. Uh, we will open the discussion first um, with you, Ed, so that you can respond to Yossi's challenging points, I think, to, to your initial talk. So, so tell, tell us what you think about Yossi's response. Thank you very much, Yossi, for a dazzling discussion, even if you ended up by accusing me of being naive. Uh, if, my, if my lecture has stimulated this kind of passionate response, I have done my job. Uh, and thank you for sending this to me last night so I had a chance to think about it a bit. Yossi has laid out some of the large group dynamics that uh, run the risk of overwhelming us. I've tried to outline the tools that might allow individuals to find themselves amidst all of that. His rich discussion is too much to respond to, but there are four points I want to take up. Representation, authority, listening, and integrity. <clears throat> I pulled out a couple of sentences from your discussion, Yossi, just because they're so evocative. Here's the first under representation. You said correctly, the autocrats are happy to crush the teamwork of the elected public representatives whose commitment to their formal roles and missions qualifies them to organize as a work group, developing reality testing and procedures based on facts and not just desires. You are completely right. This is at risk. Politics in a democracy involves representatives who must represent their constituency so they can be re-elected, but hopefully in the service of a larger mission, in my country, the Constitution. That may be getting lost, and why? Our institutions are in transition from those that support an industrial society to those that support an information society, and we are left with ossified bureaucracies, diffuse missions, corruption, fear of litigation. For example, in response to bureaucratic regulatory demands, missions that had once been inspiring have been transformed into three-page mission statements, which no one reads or remembers. If we could figure out how to craft missions that respond to the needs of society, and if, as individuals, we join those institutions because they matter, we can help transform the other into one of us, find ourselves in more rational work groups, and create a human system that serves humanity's needs. Authority. 
He also refers to Carl Jung's conversation with Freud and Freud's comment, if they only knew I was bringing them the plague. There was another thing that happened on that trip across the ocean. Jung and Freud were interpreting each other's dreams, but Freud refused to give Jung his associations. And Jung said, why? <laughs> and Freud said, if I tell you my associations, I would lose my authority. So Freud, like many of us, was wearing a mask. If you remember my case of the young psychologist and the supervisor's feet in the chairs, making your associations public in relation to a task is the core mechanism of joining. Freud couldn't risk it at the beginning of his discovery, but we might. Third point, how are they right? Yassi says, not when the other wants to annihilate you, not when the other represents a value system that endangers all you believe in and ignores you. <clears throat> yes, aggression has to be contained in order to create the possibility of listening. Yes, there needs to be a containing third to hold the pair. Jimmy Carter, when he had the Israelis and Palestinians at Camp David, found a third. He said to them, you are people of the book. And that third held. <clears throat> but it may be that when you assume that the other, as a group, wants to annihilate you, or is committed to an alternative value system that obliterates you, that assumption might just be a generalized projection that oversimplifies complexity, or an example of what I've called pathological certainty. So I'd like to leave that question open. Listening for how they are right is painful, and I'd like to illustrate what I mean. <clears throat> While I had a lot of trouble practicing what I preach, when I listened to how Donald Trump was right, I had to think he was elected by my country. So I had to ask myself, how is Donald Trump me? How was he my president? Here are some of my painful associations. Have I, like Trump, withdrawn from my institutions, dismissing them as impersonal bureaucracies that interfere with progress? Yes. Have I raged against obsessive regulations that preserve administrators over workers? Yes. Have I hunkered down in my bunker of privilege and disregarded the ongoing oppression of people who don't look like me? Yes. Have I attributed any success to my own abilities and systematically ignored the shoulders I have climbed up on and the bodies I have climbed over? Have I done this? Yes. My conclusion was that I cannot indulge my momentary relief that Trump is going away, and I certainly cannot dismiss the rest of us. We are not good, and they are not bad. We are in trouble together if we can find ways to see the same trouble. And finally, integrity. Yossi tells us a wonderful story of uh, the daughter of Germans who, held a Jew who hid a Jewish child in their home and her rage at her parents who dared to threaten her life like that. They should have run away, she said. So I find myself wondering, what were these parents actually doing? It's no surprise to you that I think they were discovering their integrity and their active citizenship. And I want to quote Erickson again. Erickson defined integrity as our obligation to the most mature meaning available to us, adding, even if this risky commitment should bring discomfort to ourselves, deprivation to our mates and offspring, and the loss of friends, all of which must be imagined and endured in order not to be exposed to a final sense of disgust and despair. This commitment is scary, and their child's anger is understandable. Yossi says, sometimes it's good to also remember that if you have to shoot, shoot, don't understand. But to Yossi and to the rest of you, I would say first, contain dangerous aggression. But then, consider listening to how the other might be right and answering the scary question, why do I have to do this, might just be a pathway out of abdication, out of a flight back to Germany, or even shooting. 
I'm not sure, as Yossi suggests, <clears throat> that such a person is a hero. Winnicott argued that for a democracy to survive, you need a certain percentage of grown-ups whose differentiated identities matter. That's what I'm trying to describe. Thank you, Yossi, for a wonderful discussion. Okay, we will now, Ed, I hope you, you could take a look at Yossi's face while you were, you know, speaking, but, but, you know, if not, we'll share the recording with you so you can see, you know, what was going on in his mind while listening to I'm you. I'm sure he'll tell me. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, we will now open to, um, an op to, to the discussion. The floor is open. A uh, free-form discussion, whoever wants to jump in. Um, the idea here is to really further um, the understanding of these issues that, that have been raised. Um, so who would like to begin? Yes. Everybody just to break the spell. Or okay, now you want to? Yeah, I no, see pl please go ahead. Please go ahead. I I'm going to say something funny. Yeah, and I, I just want to suggest for the sake of because uh, uh, we're on a few screens, uh, we might I might not be able to see whoever's raising hands. So jump in. Okay, okay. don't wait to be. Mira, please go ahead. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, I want to make two points. One, you see, uh, when I first um, uh, heard um, uh, Ed, Ed's idea, how are they right? I had, uh, which was, I don't know, several years ago in a conference, in a group relation conference in uh, Boston, near Boston. I had the, the same reaction that uh, you had. Immediately, I had all the examples about how it is impossible to maintain this stance. And they came, you know, uh, one after the other. And uh, in my mind, I proved immediately Ed wrong, uh, which was making his point, of course. Um, <laughs> It took me several years, maybe because I'm a slow learner. Uh, but first of all, to understand that it's not about um, a moral judgment. And it's not uh, a, a closed system that if one is right, the other one is wrong. It is about uh, shifting uh, perspective. Exercising, exercising, shifting perspective. And it's terribly difficult. But as far as I, uh, I uh, train in this exercise as, as much as I am possible to, I think it does open um, a window. It does open a window to listen and to retreat uh, from your self-righteousness. Uh, and I think that uh, the government that we saw yesterday in making must, had, must have had this perspective in mind. And I don't know how many of you have read Yair um, Lapid's uh, speech, the one that he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, give because he was so infuriated about the, the you know, the hooligans uh, show that went on in the parliament. Uh, it's a beautiful speech that constantly stresses taking the perspective of the other. 
And I think without this perspective, the gov this government couldn't have happened, never. Dinar, did you want to speak? Or? Yes, first of all, we are, I, I, I am from Turkey and I am living in a very polarized uh, society, as you can imagine, and we are very happy that uh, you have changed uh, your leader, uh, which is a hope for us, actually. And uh, we, um, I was going to give an example for the UOC's uh, uh, remark on the return of the hero. We had a hero lately who is a leader of a ma mafia who is in Dubai right now and sending YouTube uh, uh, videos every Sunday at seven o'clock in the morning uh, and disclosing all the dirty uh, things that the corruption that's happening in Turkey. So we are like in a kind of a Netflix series, actually, like, you know, Escobar or something. I haven't seen them, but it is full of, you know, drugs and the money laundry and the looting and everything. So I want to learn the thoughts, your thoughts, Yossi and Ed, about the governments and the power that actually manipulates people because especially Ed, your way of thinking is just uh, without taking account that our minds are under attack by this information, new information society, you know, and how can we think about the polarized, the other side, just what is right or wrong there when they're this much of manipulated or we are, I don't know. So I think that is my question to both of the speakers. Um, I, I wanted to thank you both by actually applying Ed's question to both, to understanding both of you. In other words, I ask myself, how are you both right? Because it seemed to me that in some way, the two, the two views, as a way, are complementary, and they, they represent, as it were, two, two sides of a coin that we need not lose sight of. Um, at one point, I, I must say, I, I thought, maybe this is a very crude thought, but I thought maybe this is a, an American take is against an Israeli take, you know, uh, thinking of Freud's uh, comment, etc., I don't think it's only that, because I think that there are a number of easy fallacies that we can uh, easily fall into. For example, the question, how are they right? First of all, does not imply identifying with them. Secondly, it is a question to oneself and it allows oneself to shift an internal perspective. And thirdly, and I think this was Yossi's point in a way, the fact that I ask myself, how are they right, doesn't really mean that the other side is asking themselves the same question at the same time. So there is an inequality, perhaps. In other words, it would all be fine and dandy if everybody asked themselves at the same time, how are they right? Everything would be, would be wonderful. But that's not the case in reality. But does that mean, does it mean that we shouldn't ask ourselves that question? I think we should. But I think implicit in a way, in a, in a perhaps troublesome way, in Ed's talk is a question um, which I asked myself, how can we develop a culture in which people, more and more people, ask themselves this question? Now, you know, I'm asking the question, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Obviously, <clears throat> in some way, as everything, it begins with oneself. 
In other words, if I ask myself, and you ask yourself, and so on, more and more people will ask themselves. Okay. I don't want to be naive, and I don't think that that means that we have found a way, a magical way of creating social change by that. But I, I think it's, it's a very important question nonetheless. And the more we do that, the better. And one, one last comment. I, I thought, first of all, I thought Ed's um, development of the idea of a role relatedness as being different than relationship. It struck me, and I must admit, it's the second time I hear this lecture. Um, and I've heard Ed many times, uh, but it's the first time that I really link to this idea. And to me, it's a very, very interesting and powerful idea. But again, it has the same, to my mind, the same built-in conundrum, because I know that people are tend to think in terms of the relationship, and not in terms of the role relatedness. And when you talk or act from your role relatedness, people tend, and this is my experience, they tend to view you either as authoritarian or as detached or as uh, um, arrogant or as not connected or I, I don't know because, you know, how come you're not paying attention to the relationship? So I think it's a very important tension that uh, is also important to identify because I think we do fall into this of thinking in terms of, terms of relationships instead of role relatedness when it is appropriate perhaps or when it fits, you know, when it's more important to think in terms of the role relatedness. So thank you both. Thank you for those opening questions. I want to respond before I lose, <laughs> I lose the very interesting questions that you've raised. Uh, uh, Pinar, you raised a, a point about the ways in which our minds are under attack by the information society. And, and Yossi talked about that as well. That's completely true. The question that I would raise is, will the information society, will the internet and all of that vastness and the rapidly transforming society that's increasingly articulated by the internet, will it develop its own institutions? It doesn't yet, but it might. And those institutions are containers. Uh, and it's that kind of containment that I'm trying to talk about in this, in this lecture. Now, the question about, um, <laughs> the other one doesn't ask how I'm right that point. That's true. And you can't require it when you enter into a conversation. However, if you ask yourself, how is the other person right? That, in my view, is a form of leadership. And once you shift your perspective in relation to the other, they might increase the possibility that they would consider the, that you might be right in some areas. So there's that. The final thing I want to respond to is about role relatedness, which I agree, Shmuel, I think is a very difficult and potentially quite powerful idea, but I don't think anybody, any of us can do it unless there's an institutional culture that supports it. And that has to be led from the top. If there is an institutional culture where people learn that that's actually the way to develop the mission and to engage with one another, in a relatively insanity-free dialogue. That's the way it might happen. Yes, I agree, and I just want to say one other sentence. I think it's precisely that which allowed the current government to be formed. Yes, looks that way. I wanted to um, to just share a, a reflection, really. Um, Ed, I was I was taken by what you shared about the mission statement of Austin Riggs, and it struck me that in some ways you've really taken it on full throttle 
in your approach, um, you know, if we can think of the other in politics as the, you know, patient that needs to be saved from labels, right? Um, so, it, so it really struck me and I, I thought it really helpful what someone said earlier about not seeing your comment as how are they right as a moral stance, as a moral evaluation, but more as an anthro a kind of a, a invitation to take an anthropological approach um, to the other, to understand their context, to understand our context better. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm, I'm really drawn in by this question of what integrity is. And I think as a citizen in Israel, and maybe not just in Israel, the struggle to maintain the, the, the fear of losing one's integrity by moving towards active citizenship is very much alive. So this fear that by belonging, by taking up one's membership in a group that has a life of its own will somehow invite you, seduce you into relinquishing your integrity is a fear that from my experience, you know, paralyzes, um, paralyzes profoundly. Well, doesn't that depend, <laughs> doesn't that depend on the mission of the society? If you join as an active citizen in relation to a set of values and ideals that the, that the nation has committed itself to, how do you lose your integrity? You only lose it if you've lost sight of the mission and you, you've signed up for something that doesn't actually link your own values and ideals with the mission of the nation. Yeah, that will lead us down a rabbit hole on the question of what the mission of Israel is. So. <laughs> exactly. Not only that, but where the boundaries of Israel is. The question in my mind is why is the rest of the world so interested in Israel? What is it doing on our behalf? And what's the nature of those boundaries that you all are trying to figure out? That's a whole other set of questions. I think that the boundaries change um, in a very deep way when we think about the internet world because the whole it's it's a it's a completely different change so maybe um, we have to think about boundaries differently in, in a more breathing way maybe i'm very excited about this evening i have to say really it's, it's really very interesting. I just had to say that. <laughs> Thanks, Eva. Mm -hmm. I think it's also taking place, Yad, I want to continue what you're saying because I really think that it's taking place at, at a pivotal moment. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of uh, emotions going on, Yad. I identify with what you're saying very much. I think, you know, the, this moment of, of change, Pinar, which you also pointed to, I think is, is kind of in the air in Israel now and is affecting us in, in this evening, in, in this event, of course, as well, but also... Um, you want it too. <laughs> yes, I hear that, Pinar, yes. Yes, it's interesting. And we wanted it when, when it happened in the United States before it happened in Israel. So there's like a movement here going on, which is very interesting to, to, to identify and understand. Only it's part of the society. The atmosphere of change or the rejoice of the change. Only part of the society. And that's true in the United States as well. I feel actually it touches very deeply in the area between individuality and uh, a part of the society or a part of organization. Because the question that you said, why me or who am I? And how can I find actually my voice? You know, Yossi said before about going to, to the Balfour Square, yeah? 
and and the question is it is it really my voice is my voice is the the anti somebody else and not for whom am i i think this is really deep question about what how can i keep myself and being part actually of an organization and part of a mission i think it's a very delicate point that you touch us and thank you for that You know, um, I've had this conversation quite a lot. In uh, group relations conferences, we, we tell people that we're offering them opportunities to learn about authority and leadership. But for me, the prime learning of group relations conferences is membership. We learn how to join something, and we relax the boundaries around ourselves to incorporate others in relation to a task. I think that's the deepest learning that comes out of those conferences. Yeah. You can't say, Donald Trump's a good example of this. I don't think it's possible to be a competent leader if you don't know how to be a member. And Donald Trump never joined anything in his life. I think actually it's very true. And it's, uh, you know, the, the being members and being leaders, I think uh, we, we used to, to say that it's in the Little Prince, you know, in the book, that actually you can't be a leader without being uh, a member. So I think uh, yeah. yes, I I certainly agree. I think that this uh, the learning about membership in a group relations conference is uh, is very significant, and I think it has a lot to do with the emphasis on learning through and about roles. It's again this issue of role relatedness that allows one to join in a way that is not merely the emotional relationship way. That's something else and it mobilizes other parts of you. Shmuel, I agree, but it takes the, the holding of the group relation conference that allows you really to take roles and, you know, to, to expand yourself. It's, exactly. it's a completely different situation when you're a member in a country and, you know, it's, all, it's really frightening. I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. In the group relations, it's the institution. Yeah. In the country, the question is, is the, are the institutions holding up? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. More ideas from other parts? I have an uh, association to mm -hmm. the talks uh, because I'm thinking it is a dilemma. Uh, to be in a role, it means both uh, to be a, a whole person but also to know that I am part of something larger. And uh, I remember, and I have this uh, saying of Hillel Zaken, I'll say it in Hebrew, and, and then maybe, uh, Shelley, you will help me translate it. Im en anili mili, v'anili chshatzmi mani. And the last thing is, v'im lo achshav im but uh, the, the two first, uh, Parts. How would you translate it, Shelley? <laughs> I, I think we'll need more help here for that. Um, if, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Right? That's the first part. Yeah. And, um, and I by myself, who or what am I? 
what does it make what does it make uh, what sense does it make right so I think that both parts um, it's kind of dialectic uh, thinking that uh, and and I'm thinking about the story of Thomas that uh, uh, at the same time he was very much uh, full responsible for himself and he And he realized that uh, if he's not taking responsibility for for what is happening around him um, uh, it's uh, something that he lost he, he lose meaning to himself that's uh, my thoughts about that's the, that's the, that's a, that's the essential dilemma is it possible to be just for yourself and without being a part of something else. Uh, that articulation is very useful and very clear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but on the same time, we have to be ourselves. Well, Fully you know, ourselves. Or you know, responsible. We, we are taught that when we leave the family and grow up, we are for ourselves. But we, uh, and the argument I'm making is that we do not lose the fact that we are representatives. And other people see it. I was, <laughs> I was at a conference once, a group relations conference, and somebody told me that I was Russian. And that's several generations back, and I had no idea that it was visible. Uh-huh. You know it's uh, I think next uh, next uh, in, in one or two weeks it's exactly 10 years to the social protest movement uh, in Israel and the whole uh, wave of uh, social protest movements now I think it's uh, it's very much to the point of your uh, of both your talks because a young girl, was uh, let out of her rented apartment and she took a tent and planted it on the boulevard. She didn't know whom she represents. She didn't know what she is exactly doing on behalf of everybody else. But apparently she did something because in a matter of a day or a week and uh, a month, of course, thousands of people joined her. Now, I uh, did a, a lecture in the uh, Eric Miller Memorial about the social uh, uh, protest uh, movement. So I read quite a bit about it. And uh, most of the... references were that it was a failure that it was a summer hype and uh, young people having uh, fun in the nice weather of Tel Aviv uh, uh, spending times in uh, tents and nothing came out of it I did not agree at the time and I don't agree uh, now and one of the immediate Uh, consequences of uh, results of this protest was the appearance of uh, the Yeshatid uh, movement. It was uh, the immediate uh, uh, result. And 10 years later, uh, the leader of this party that is a result of that uh, movement, of that protest movement, and the Uh, having um, having the Ruach Gabit, the, the uh, backwinds of the Balfour protests, are now creating the, the government. So my point is that, uh, you know, we are all constantly representatives of uh, things that are larger than ourselves. We don't always know it. And it, take our, it takes courage and it takes leadership to materialize something, even if we are not in full control of the meaning of it. Many times it fails and it doesn't lead to anything. 
Sometimes it takes ma many years to see that it works. And sometimes it uh, works uh, faster. It would be good to hear from more parts. Um, I think it, it would be interesting to, to hear. We heard, we heard Pinar from Turkey. If there are more points of view here uh, that we could hear, it would be good. Yeah, uh, I'm from Hungary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I first heard Dr. Shapiro at Opus. Uh, my role is a social commentator as a journalist. That's one of my roles. And I was very much drawn to Opus itself, which speaks of countries as having a personality, as countries having an unconscious. Uh, and I would like to just maybe from my simple viewpoint, simplify what I see happening. Uh, I see the tragedies and the chaos in Israel as a splintered society with many, many different sides that gained some cohesion after the Rabin uh, assassination as a theocracy. And if we recall at that time, that's when Finkelstein became the advisor for Netanyahu. Finkelstein to me is a unifying force in what is happening today. If we talk of impact on the mind or recoloring of the mind, it's critical. I think that we stray away from metaphors like law of the father or the Messiah, ancient father, Finkelstein simply used a neurological method of the brain being three layered and that if the, if the deep brain was stimulated, pushed, that is pain, fear, existential concerns, hate, uh, you will gather in the votes. This unfortunately was the truth that happened all over the place. It's a simple-minded model, but it's highly effective. You can see it day by day with Natayanu. You see it after, unfortunately, Natayanu introduced Finkelstein to our leader, Orban, thrilled that he had something scientific and effective. And you can go on and, and follow this to Britain even. That is, if we talk about the effects of the media, you have the clearest example of Finkelstein's methodology being harnessed by Bannon in Cambridge Analytica and, and Brexit it became a work sample, successful work sample for Trump. Now, I don't know if this makes sense to a group of analysts or how this could be integrated into a, a psychoanalytic view. In Hungary, it makes perfect sense. That is what I think Professor Shapiro is talking about is a participatory democracy that needs fundamentally trust. In Hungary, it was, ne was never, never, never allowed to look and digest our past, to look at the World War II or the Cold War. And unfortunately, the losses tragedy replicated. Uh, and that is what Finkelstein saw here. Press pain and you'll get gain. I think you're raising a very uh, important question. And that is, what does it take to resist the temptations of pornography? Hmm. I just want to say we have time for about two more 
uh, comments or sharing of thoughts before we were on the boundary of time soon. Now, I didn't understand that, Dr. Shapiro. Could you expand on that a little bit? What, what, what are you saying? Pornography does exactly what you just said. It appeals to the base emotions, the deep brain, the stimulation, and the question of what it takes to resist that pull is a serious one. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to add a, a very small comment. I find myself the few last weeks watching in the TV the the, the right uh, right left right the right channel wing. in Israel the right wing yeah. the right wing channel in Israel because I felt that I'm really curious to understand. What's going on there? And what I find that deeply, 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 there is a pain. There is a deep pain that is a stimulate of all what we are seeing. And I, I think that it needs from us a, a really a, a pay, patient and a container to to find this pain on the other side, and this is what I I understand to find what is right in the opposite uh, uh, view. You understand me very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will pass over now, Yossi, and add to you to kind of for your concluding words. Okay, you have I, think I, I think I just gave my concluding okay. words. <laughs> thank, you, thank you all for your comments and for engaging in this discussion. Uh, obviously, these issues are very important to me to have a, an opportunity to discuss them with such an audience is a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, uh, I, I will just say one sentence, you know, I, I tried to take up my role as a discussion a bit like the devil's advocate and take, you know, uh, the other side and really allowed myself to, to say aloud thoughts I keep usually privately. But my, my context was this. I think that there is the level of what should be and this is the level what actually happens. And I try to give words to the level of what actually happens. What actually happens is that we can't isolate ourselves from the, our surrounding. We, the subject is an I group, so to speak. And, but I think that the ethical effort you had are preaching for, so to speak, is a very important one. I think I, I agree with this fully. I think we should find a way to you know who we are and to know who the other is and we try to understand. But I think that most of the time I hear a false, to, you know, the false self talking. I, I hear the, the wish to understand as a kind of anxiety to own our own aggression, as a kind of even arrogance. It is, you know, you have to be powerful in order to think that you can understand the one who wants to kill you. So my point is, my point is that there is something really to think about, namely, when is it possible? When is it healthy? When is it dangerous? I don't want to be demagogic and say, I don't want to understand the Nazis, but I think it makes a point. But I, this is my point, and uh, I, I am very grateful, Ed, that you allowed this talk and to everybody who said, his ideas into you, Shelley. Thank you very much. Your, your point, Yossi, is just right. And the, I just shape it a little bit. It's under what conditions is this possible? This is the best formulation to close so, this discussion. 
So we end with the, with the two sides of the coin connected, as Shmuel said in the beginning, which is a good place to end. So, <laughs> so thank you all um, for joining in this, uh, in this event um, and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, thank so, you. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.